disclaimer there will be some upsetting scenes and sensitive topics being discussed so i'll leave some timestamps in the description for sections you might want to skip it's part one if you missed it without wasting any more time let's commence world war one you've got trench warfare no man's land and it'll be over by christmas repeated every year oh wait that was the western front on the eastern front you have armored trains the czechoslovak legion and cavalry charges that would put the wing to disaster shame with ukraine right in the middle by 1917, the European powers had been at war for three years. Millions of lives had been lost, and nothing much had been achieved. Ukraine itself had bore the brunt of much of the war in the East, with hundreds of thousands fighting and dying for both the Russian and Austro-Hungarian empires. After the Russians launched the Brusilov Offensive of 1916, Russia came under control of major parts of Austrian Galicia, and began to institute major language reforms, quickly changing place names from German and Ukrainian to Russian. For example, modern day Lviv was changed from Lemberg in German to Lvov, and the use of Ukrainian was prohibited. The Russian language was also institutionalized in education and other sectors. Austrian Galicia, in particular, had long remained a target of Imperial Russia, as it served as a main base for the Ukrainophile movement. Despite Russia's capture of these territories, the cost of war would begin to prove too much, leading to the eventual overthrow of Tsarist rule and the creation of the Provisional Government in March of 1917. Under this umbrella of chaos, the Ukrainian intellectuals immediately set to work on demanding Ukraine's autonomy under whatever system would emerge. The Ukrainian activists organized themselves into the Central Rada, or Council, led by Mikhailo Khrushchevsky. Khrushchevsky had been one of the main Ukrainophile activists in Austrian Galicia and had been a primary target for the Russians before the war. In a letter sent by Shrushevsky to the provisional government, demands were made for Ukraine's territorial autonomy and complete independence was threatened if this was not granted. Territorial autonomy was declared in June of 1917, but was opposed by not only the provisional government, but also high-ranking officials like Vasily Shulgin and Vladimir Lenin of the Bolshevik faction. A common argument was that outright Ukrainian independence would be detrimental to Russian unity as a whole. They had more to worry about, however, as the March Revolution wasn't the only revolution that would happen. In November, the Bolsheviks overthrew the Provisional Government and replaced it with the Petrograd Soviet, based in modern-day St. Petersburg. Attempts to ally the Central Raja of Ukraine led nowhere, and the Bolsheviks would soon label it as an enemy of the revolution. Okay, so from this point on, it all gets pretty messy, with loads of different factions all fighting for Ukrainian independence, some merging with each other, breaking apart, sometimes fighting against one another. If you're not interested in all of the different factions, then just skip to the timestamp on the screen. The Bolsheviks marched into the eastern city of Kharkiv and created the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, or SSR, in the east. Independence, followed by the founding of the Ukrainian People's Republic, UPR, was proclaimed through the Fourth Universal Decree, with the UPR directly competing with the Ukrainian SSR. As the Russian Empire basically imploded, the Central Rada felt it necessary to request German and Austro-Hungarian military assistance in fending off the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were soon beaten back and were forced to sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in the spring of 1918. In this, they were forced to cede not only Ukraine but Belarus and the Baltic states, which included some of the most productive and industrialized land of the former Russian Empire. Now under German control, the Ukrainians found themselves a part of the new Ukrainian Hetmanate, a puppet regime led by Hetman Pavlo Skoropadsky, a descendant of a prominent Cossack noble family. In exchange for providing 1 million tons of grain to the Central Powers, German and Austrian military assistance would be given to push the Red Army out of Ukraine. Skoropadsky faced immediate difficulty as reforms promised by the Central Rada, such as land reform, were not granted to the peasants, causing a wave of uprisings in the countryside and mass defections to the Bolsheviks. With the German surrender and the end of World War I on the Western Front, the Ukrainian People's Republic was left without support and had to rely on itself for defence. The complete disintegration of the Austro-Hungarian Empire also led to the declaration of the West Ukrainian People's Republic, comprising former Austrian ruled Galicia. Unification talks between the two Ukrainian states began almost immediately, though each side faced their own problems. For the Eastern Republic, halting the Bolshevik advance was of utmost priority, whilst internal power struggles took hold within. For the Western Republic, the Poles represented the greatest threat, as they claimed Galicia in its entirety, including large cities with a Polish majority such as Lviv. Zahi Plochy states that the unification between these two Ukrainian states was limited more to a mere military alliance instead of a complete union. In the south of Ukraine, 
Former Russian general Anton Denikin and his white forces aimed for the restoration of the old imperial order and fought against the Red Army whilst in the east of Ukraine, the anarchist Nesta Makhno led a de facto Ukrainian state in alliance with the Bolsheviks against the whites. As Denikin was succeeded by Pyotr Wrangel as the leader of the whites, talks began with the Raja of the UPR for an alliance against the Red Army in exchange for a confederation within a Russian state once the war had been won. This move was incredibly unpopular as some believed it was yet another agreement to subordinate Ukraine to Russia, but the deal was more pragmatic if anything. Beyond external threats, the UPR was facing an internal power struggle as mentioned before, between the Minister of Defense Simon Petliura and pro-Bolshevik Volodymyr Vinyshenko. Petliura would later prevail, gaining control of the WUPR's Galician army in the process and using it to bolster the forces of the UPR in the east. Despite this, the Bolsheviks renewed their offensive into central Ukraine and decimated the UPR forces, forcing Petliura into an alliance with the Polish army led by Józef Pilsudski in exchange for recognizing Polish claims on Galicia. Even this, however, would prove unable to preserve Ukrainian independence as the Bolsheviks crushed the Polish-Ukrainian army at Kyiv and pushed all the way to the Polish capital of Warsaw. The Treaty of Riga in 1920 finally brought peace between the Bolsheviks and Poland, whom agreed to split Ukraine with Galicia and Volhynia going to the latter, and the remainder going to the Bolsheviks. The leader of Poland at the time, Józef Pilsudski, had wished for an independent Ukraine to act as a buffer state between itself and Russia, imagined as part of the Intermarium, an alliance between nations stretching from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. This hope was dashed, however, during the Treaty of Riga, but many Ukrainians had hoped for further Polish intervention against the Bolsheviks. With the signing of the Treaty of Riga came an end to the dream of an independent Ukraine, but that would not spell the end of attempts to free it. In fact, the struggle for survival would only increase in scope and further from here on out. Once again partitioned between multiple states, Ukraine was back to foreign subservience, this time under a system unprecedented in its ideological and political demands. In December 1922, the Ukrainian SSR, alongside Russia and a number of other states, joined to form the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The leader of the Russian Soviet government, Vladimir Lenin, founded the USSR in direct opposition to the General Secretary Joseph Stalin, who desired a Russian federation comprising former Tsarist territories with some measure of autonomy. Lenin's desire for a union formed of equals clashed with Stalin's desire to see a centralized state where Russia would play the leading role. Early Soviet policy toward its constituent nationalities reflected Lenin's fears that the greatest threat to the Union weren't the Poles or external powers, but instead the nationalism within. What would become known as Great Russian Chauvinism, which in Lenin's view had brought about the end of the Russian Empire, was now the main enemy of the Union. The new nationality policy adopted to tackle this was known as Koronizatsia, or indigenization. According to this policy, the culture and language of the various ethnic groups within the Union would be allowed to flourish, whilst native people would be appointed to governing positions within their homeland. This policy was carried out with Ukraine in mind, as the Ukrainians constituted the largest minority group in the USSR. The ultimate goal of Koronizatsia was to change the peasant perception of the Union, as well as allow nationalism to quickly wither away, eliminating it as a problem entirely. Despite these efforts, ethnic representation was lacklustre in the makeup of the various communist parties. For example, though ethnic Ukrainians made up 80% of Ukraine's total population of 30 million, over 76% of the Ukrainian Communist Party were actually ethnic Russian. Additionally, many cities in the east and south of Ukraine, including Kharkiv and Odessa, had substantial populations which used the Russian as their native language. Forced Ukrainization of these populations was seen as controversial at best, and calls for it were ignored. By the late 1920s, the policy had some effect. The use of the Ukrainian language had risen drastically, whilst the representation of Ukrainians in Bolshevik institutions had increased, though such effects were limited to the countryside, where historical Russification had been limited. Following Lenin's death in 1924, and Stalin's victory in the ensuing power struggles, Koronizatsia was toned down as Stalin considered Russian dominance to be the necessary guiding force within the USSR. To that end, Ukrainian culture and autonomy would have to be curtailed. In 1929, Stalin began a purge of those he saw to be promoting Ukrainian nationalism, and with it effectively ended the indigenization policy. Efforts of Ukrainization continued more as a token gesture, but paled in scope compared to that of the earlier 1920s. By now, Ukraine had been divided between four nations, 
Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland and the USSR, each with their own rules on handling their respective Ukrainian minorities. In Polish ruled Galicia, authorities took an aggressive stance against what it saw as dangerous Ukrainian nationalism and sought to polonize the population as quickly as possible. Many Ukrainian schools were shut down or forced to teach Polish whilst government positions were given almost exclusively to ethnic Poles. The Ukrainians however wouldn't go down without a fight, of which the consequences would still be felt decades later. The Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, or OUN, headed by ultra-nationalist Stepan Bandera, engaged the Polish authorities through guerrilla warfare and assassinations, aiming in his own words for an independent Ukraine. Across the border, Stalin began to reverse the indigenization policy, believing that minority nationalism, especially on the peripheries of the USSR, could and would be exploited by outside powers. He thus began to order internal deportations of various ethnic groups, including Poles, Germans, Ukrainians, and most notably the Crimean Tatars, who in 1944 would suffer a major wave of deportations to Siberia. In particular, Stalin believed that the Ukrainian intelligentsia were potential instruments of insurgency and sought to eliminate them. Perhaps the most infamous and controversial action taken by Stalin pre-World War II was the Holodomor, argued to be an intentional terror famine aimed at Ukrainians, which happened in between 1932 and 1933. The policy of collectivization, putting several small farm holdings together into a larger communal unit, was enforced across Ukraine, seizing holdings from what were seen as rich bourgeois farmers, referred to as kulaks. These kulaks were later considered to be anyone that resisted collectivization, and many were exiled to Siberia, executed or simply starved to death, bringing an end to almost 4 million lives in Ukraine alone. From the rise of various independence factions in the Civil War to the suppression of dissent and culture in the USSR, Ukraine would continue to face a perilous future. That was the second episode. If you enjoyed that, please leave a like and subscribe, it'd be much appreciated. Now go grab yourself a sandwich or something.